feel energised or are you, are you flagging at the end of the day? We are hope for energy anyway. So uh, my name's Jack Grit. I am a girl, not a boy. Um, this often confuses people in the industry. Uh, I've been in the nuclear industry for uh, nu civil uh, for 34 years now. Um, oh, I thought I heard someone say you don't look old enough, but uh, obviously not. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm also president of Women in Nuclear, so um, I'd just like to thank Tom for inviting me here today to, to host this panel. Uh, but he also asked me if I could just say a little bit about women in nuclear before we start to just bring a little bit of inclusion and diversity into the proceedings today. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, so WIN is uh, an organisation that's global. It includes over 30 countries that have formal chapters, but about 60 countries that are involved in some way. Uh, WIN UK has only been around for five years. I don't know how we missed a trick, how we've not been, you know, had, a, had this organisation here uh, longer than that. But anyway, we've been around five years now. So what is our kind of purpose? Well, if you have a quick look at the demographic in this room of gender, uh, basing it on two genders, because that's the only information I have at the moment with my eyes, we are mainly men. And that is not unusual. If you look right across the nuclear industry, whether it's defence, medicine, uh, civil, it is uh, predominantly men that come to our industry. So we kind of go, well, why? Why is that? How does this happen? Um, because there are lots of great women scientists, engineers. Uh, we're actually not just limited to that. Financial people, lawyers, project managers, a whole host of um, roles that we need within our industry that women are very good at. So uh, the question was asked, and that's what Wynne started to have a look at, and that's our mission now, is to say, why don't people come to our industry? Is it a fear of nuclear? Is it because it's not an inviting industry? Is it the geography of the industry? A lot of the places that we work in nuclear are quite isolated places. Um, is it because we don't encourage girls enough to go into STEM at school. So lots of reasons, far too many to go into in my couple of minutes today. But basically, we now have three key objectives, which is attraction, retention, dialogue. So how do we attract people to our industry? How do we retain these women in our industry once we attract them? And dialogue with public, government, industry, individuals, to understand what we can do better to get more women into our industry. So that's a little bit about WIN. Sound all right? All right. <laughs> um, so just before we start, I want to say, I just want to talk about why I believe inclusion is really important. So this isn't just about more women, more men, or an equal balance. It's about everybody, men and women, feeling included where they work. So um, I thought it might get you moving and keep you a bit more interested if I could ask you all to stand up. And then I'm going to ask you a question. Now, it's a, it's a sort of personal question, so if you don't want to answer for you, you can answer for your friend or someone you know. Have you ever, stay standing, if you've ever felt excluded in your working role? Stay standing if you felt excluded in some way from life. Well, at work, excluded in a role, excluded in a function, uh, just felt in some way that you weren't included, uh, the same as everybody else? Okay. Stay standing, of those left, if that felt uncomfortable and unpleasant and not nice. Someone didn't give a damn over there. <laughs> Okay. Stay standing if you think that has an impact on your performance and how you're going to do well in your job. Okay. Right. There's only a few of you left, but enough that that makes an impact on business. So for me, you may all sit now, thank you very much. So for me, the reason that inclusion is important is because it impacts business, it impacts performance. Ultimately, it impacts profitability, it imp impacts progress. Uh, when we did that at the WIN conference, every person in the room was still standing. So you're a lucky bunch if uh, quite a few of you have never felt excluded because it's, uh, it isn't always a great place to be. So congrats to those that sat down 
um, and come join the, 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 the fight for those that were still standing up. <laughs> I shall leave it there. Uh, I would now like to introduce our lovely panel and hand over to them. So our session is about nuclear economies and geographies across the, uh, the board. And uh, we've got three fabulous esteemed speakers here. So we've got uh, Geoffrey Chapman, who's a PhD candidate at King's College London. Um, his thesis examines the roles of tacit knowledge within Britain's nuclear weapons programme. Uh, we've got Stephen Beckett, who graduated from the University of Bristol um, and works for Rolls-Royce, and he's now working in the Rolls-Royce submarines as an optimization engineer, uh, looking to use data to improve uh, the approach to in-service maintenance of those submarines. And we've got Thomas Davis, uh, who's the Director and Nuclear Energy Consultant at Davis and Musgrave Limited. Uh, he's a third-year PhD researcher at the University of Oxford. So those are our three fabulous people. And first, I'd like to invite Geoffrey to speak. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, just once again. So I'm Geoffrey Chapman. I'm a PhD student at King's College London. And I'll be presenting some of my research on how AWRE, that is the precursor to AWE, came to value the skills that were embodied within its individual employees and how this went on to affect weapons policy in the 1960s. So in terms of the theoretical framework for my research, I've looked at uh, Mackenzie and Spinardi's 1995 art uh, article, which suggested an uninvention hypothesis towards nuclear weapons. Uh, they suggested that a lack of testing experience in a post-testing um, world could lead to the accidental uninvention of nuclear weapons due to the loss of tacit knowledge relating to nuclear weapons. So tacit knowledge is a type of non-verbal knowledge that is only learned by doing and embodied within individuals. It cannot be transmitted via lectures or written words. And what I'm going to suggest is a very similar argument was created by AWRE, AWRE and used in the 1960s in favor of a Polaris hardening program. So in terms of substantiating this argument, I argue that it first emerges in 1954 in the aftermath of the foundation of the UK Atomic Energy Authority, which was the parent body to AWRE. Uh, it was created due to perceived deficiencies um, when running the fission program under uh, the Scientific Civil Service, uh, and the UK Atomic Energy Authority was a nationalized corporation, supposedly to allow greater flexibility in the employment of the staff at AWRE. Um, however, the foundation of the Atomic Energy Authority actually created a morale crisis within uh, AWRE because it created worries about the future careers of the staff involved as they could no longer transfer to other departments in the case of an arms control regime being imposed upon nuclear weapons. Um, within this context, individual employees began to identify themselves as weaponeers with very specific skills that were necessary for the function of the UK's nuclear weapons program and how they had to be provided with a sustainable career to keep them within their role and they were arguing that they were well had to be employed for the program to function as a whole um, Um, so the proposed solution to this problem was a program of research diversification where AWRE were provided, uh, well, meant to be provided with uh, non-nuclear weapons atomic research, um, which would provide this opportunity to have a long-term career even in the event of the imposition of an arms control regime. Um, and I would argue that this set the principle that in terms of retaining staff, um, work could be provided to maintain skills within the program. Fortunately for the managers at AWRE, actually providing this work um, immediately wasn't essential because in 1954, Britain embarked upon its thermonuclear weapons program. This necessitated a rapid expansion of AWRE, which nearly doubled in size between 1954 and 1958. Even with the completion of the thermonuclear weapons program, oh, well, the testing of the thermonuclear weapons, um, by 1958, um, there was the conclusion of the mutual defense agreement between Britain and America, which created a new tranche of work for the weapons establishment, which necessitated the anglicization of American warheads. This created a short-term requirement for even more staff, with the number of uh, individuals employed at the weapons establishment reaching nearly 9,000 in the early 1960s. 
However, the Macmillan government, recognizing the diminishing role of Britain in the world, realized that there needed to be defense cuts um, in particular, and this would fall heavily upon the nuclear weapons establishment. And by 1962, there were plans underway to um, about half the number of employees at the weapons establishment. And it is within this context that uh, the man senior management at AWRE created this argue uh, argument, which is very analogous to the uninvention hypothesis forwarded by Mackenzie and Spinardi, in that the uninvention of Britain's nuclear weapons program was possible due to the loss of the special skills that were embodied within individuals employed at AWRE, not only within individuals, but collectively uh, within AWRE as a whole. And if these skills were lost, then they could not be reconstituted and Britain would lose its nuclear weapons capability permanently. Because there was a need to maintain these staff with their special skills, um, there was a need for work to keep them in their various jobs. Um, so they once again forwarded an argument that more nuclear weapons work was needed to keep them in their roles. Fortunately for the managers at AWRE, even when the prospect of this work wasn't forthcoming, the Skybolt crisis of 1962 gave the weapons establishment a new tranche of work as the creation of warheads for the Polaris missiles was made necessary. However, upon the completion of this new batch of work, the, the need for new work came around again by 1966. And it is within this context that the need for Polaris uh, hardening uh, was first proposed uh, for the need to retain capabilities at the weapons establishment. Now it was framed around retaining a cohort of about 6,000 staff with about 4,500 employed on nuclear weapons work and 1,500 employed on civilian diversified nuclear research. However, this proved extremely controversial within the Wilson government as the Labour government at the time had a strong unilateralist disarmament streak. So providing more work to the weapons establishment was highly controversial. No agreement was reached in the, at a cabinet level, and there was intense disagreement between the Department of Economic Affairs and the Treasury on the one hand, who favoured, say, disarmament, and the Ministry of Defence and Foreign Office, who forwarded Polaris hardening. A compromise was reached by 19, uh, the end of 1967, where an inquiry would be held on what could constitute the minimum effort that could sustain AWRE in the long run. There was an expectation by the Treasury that this would constitute a radical review that could reduce um, spending at AWRE, whereas even the MOD thought that some cuts were necessary. It was only the weapons establishment itself that believed that its cohort of 6,000 staff was necessary for its sustainment. In the event, um, this, uh, the inquiry was held, and it was called the King's Norton Inquiry, and it concluded after three months' uh, work that because the highest levels of safety and reliability in the warheads had to be maintained, uh, and this could only be maintained through retaining the skills of the staff employed, that no cuts in terms of the number of staff could really be uh, envisaged. Only a small reduction in support staff could be countenanced. Furthermore, because there was a need to employ this near 6,000 staff level, um, there was a problem of spare capacity where work would have to be provided for these staff um, for them to be kept in their respective roles. This outcome proved highly controversial with the chief scientific advisor for the government calling it a whitewashing report. Uh, and while they were extremely, well, well, extreme looked upon the outcome with disfavor, uh, n n many of the critics um, couldn't propose a better method for determining the, uh, m well, minimum effort that could keep AWRE sustainable. Due to the inability to impose effective cuts upon the establishment, inaction um, reigned in terms of the remaining years of the Wilson administration, um, which allowed more resources to be slowly diverted within AWRE towards Polaris hardening, which eventually allowed for it to be approved under the Heath administration. So in terms of tacit knowledge as an argument, or the argument that AWRE created by itself, it, it's a powerful argument for the status quo within nuclear weapons establishment and potentially a way to you know, divert extra resources and work towards the weapons establishment to retain skills to keep the project going. It is a reoccurring argument. It came up again in the 1990s with arguments over creating a new tactical uh, nuclear weapon system called the Tactical Air to Surface Missile. And elements of it can be seen in the justification for the capability sustainment program and in a negative sense towards why Trident has to, has to be chosen for the next weapon system in the Trident Alternatives Review. 
While it is perhaps easy to suggest that it is a cynical argument used by the weapons establishment exclusively for their benefit, there are many instances where the weapons establishment has worked in a very sincere way to retain uh, and recruit skills within it in terms of programs, in terms of providing better employment um, conditions uh, and pay to try and keep skills within the establishment. However, what one can note is that it is incredibly difficult for those outside of the weapons establishment to challenge the numbers that the weapons establishment suggests that are necessary. And therefore, um, in terms of debating this argument, is incredibly difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you, Geoffrey. Um, Stephen will now come and join us uh, to give us his uh, speech. Stephen, I couldn't get because you Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Jack, for the introduction. So I want to talk through uh, something slightly different and something we might sort of not have thought about too much today. But before I do so, just a quick disclaimer to say that none of the opinions within this presentation are those of Rolls-Royce or represent their opinions or position. Um, to start off with a few facts. So the UK is projected to increase its peak electricity usage by 35% by 2050. It's also part of the Paris Agreement, which as of uh, the day before yesterday, um, and Theresa May's statement on reaching net zero CO2 by 2050 uh, means we've potentially got a bit of work to do in reducing our CO2 uh, emissions. Our nuclear power generation capacity is set to decrease by 48% by 2025 and 60% by 2035. Against that, three of six of our new nuclear builds are currently on hold, uh, either temporarily or permanently. And a 2008 government white paper on nuclear power, which is the most recent one that's been released thus far, said that more than ever before, nuclear power has a key role to play as part of the UK's energy mix. So we've got quite a few conflicting facts and quite a few different things to, uh, to analyse. And one of what I wanted to do through the course of this presentation is just have a look at a few of them uh, and, more importantly, look at what we might be able to do to resolve some of the conflicts. So in terms of current demand, uh, UK power generation was largely coal-driven uh, prior to 1990. Uh, since then, it's changed to gas and renewable-driven. Um, between 2016 and 2017, renewable usage has increased, as one might expect, uh, and that's likely to continue into the future. And as well as that, we import around 3 gigawatts of power um, from Holland and France. Nuclear throughout the period of the last 30 years has re retained, uh, remained static at around 20% of generation, um, but it represents 9% of installed capacity, which is quite important to note because it speaks to uh, nuclear's very high utilisation factor. It's best to just turn a nuclear power plant on, leave it on for, at full power for as long as you possibly can. Of those, there are eight operating stations, of which seven are due to close by 2025. In terms of the future, so the graph that you can see is a graph that's been produced by the National Grid last year, and it tries to indicate what peak electricity demand is going to look like between now and 2050. You can see that the peak electricity demand is going to increase by around about 30%, so the four different lines represent four different scenarios, two of which meet the 2050 uh, net zero CO2 and two of which don't. But all of them show a significant increase in our peak power usage as we move towards increased electrification, both of public and private transport, uh, and also increased electrification of heating. Base load capacity through that from industry and things like that is expected to stay constant at around 28 gigawatts. The fundamental principle behind this is that we all want an increased quality of life. We all want to be able to travel more. We all want uh, to use more resources. But against that is an overwhelming need to decarbonise those sources, those sources of energy that we use. And the only way to do that generally is to increase the amount of electricity we use and then decar decarbonise our electricity production. And therefore, electricity usage is very likely to increase in the near future. So how are we going to meet that? Well, the graph that you can see there shows future capacity. The dotted line represents 2015, so a few years ago. Um, but it's important to note that installed capacity um, now is in a lot of cases likely to be shut down. And uh, in 2035, we're going to be relying on sources that are not generally built now. Nuclear, of course, is one of those. And the 20% of capacity that I spoke about earlier um, for 2035 is not currently built uh, and should have been, or in some cases, is being built at the moment. The nuclear capacity that we might need um, can be seen in that graph there. So that shows that in about 1995 to uh, 2000, there was about 12,000 megawatts of uh, nuclear power generation capacity within the UK. 
um, but since then that's decreased significantly as the uh, Magnox reactors first and soon the AGRs will be shut down. The only installed capacity in 2035 is the hatch line that you can see which represents Hinkley C. And of course that hasn't come online and is subject to significant delays and significant cost overruns. So clearly it's a complex picture. We understand that um, through the increases in electrification that we can expect, we need more power. Um, we also think that we probably could do with a similar amount of nuclear power, um, but that's not currently being installed in the way that we need it to be installed. So what's going wrong? Well, UK nuclear policy is a complex area, and in a lot of the ways that we've heard already today, in the defence realm, it's particularly complicated, but domestic new builds also very complicated. Up until 1996, uh, all the build in this country was um, done nationally, so all the Magnus reactors, the AGRs, and so on were all built uh, publicly. From 2008 to 2015, government policy changed. So it aimed to influence the marketplace. It aimed to influence the marketplace to create um, a, an environment where vendors thought it was likely to be financially viable to invest in products. And that was done via uh, contracts for difference. So the graph that you can see there shows effectively a strike price. And this was something that was used successfully to get Hinkley C built, um, but arguably at a very high cost. So the cost, the strike price for Hinkley C was set at £92.50 per megawatt hour. That's now risen to £107 per megawatt hour, which doesn't compare favorably with the most recent round of offshore wind funding which went for £55 per megawatt hour. So clearly, there's something there. The incentive has to be so great to the vendor that they actually consider building it off their own back with their own money, which doesn't necessarily coincide with other, off, uh, other renewable sources. So following Hinkley C, the government agreed to take a, create a stake in projects. For Wilva, which is the uh, plant on Anglesey that's recently fall, fallen through, the government offered a one-third stake uh, in the project. They also considered the entire debt financing um, and a strike price of no more than £75 per megawatt hour. Unfortunately, Hitachi rejected that, and in doing so, their chairman said that the only way that new, new nuclear was going to be built in the UK was if it was done entirely uh, nationally, as was done previously. So the chairman of Hitachi has been quite damning in saying that effectively there is no way that private enterprises are going to take on the risk associated with nuclear new build. So, Clearly, we need to do something to change the risk and reward picture. This is basically um, the idea that fundamentally, nuclear power stations take such a long time to build, they're so complicated and expensive, that no enterprise is going to take it on of their own accord. So in terms of the risk side, currently, there are things like decommissioning costs that a utility has to co uh, consider at the end of life. There's also public opinion, which is very variable. Um, it might be favorable at one point in time, but negative in the future. There are very significant build costs. To give you some idea, a 2008 uh, estimate for Hinkley C suggested that it would cost four billion for two reactors. The most recent esp estimate now suggests that's 24 billion, which in terms of cost escalation is very significant. It was first conceived in 2007. It looks likely it will first generate power in 2025. So a 17-year project time scale before the utility gets any return on their investment. And that's significant, and that dissuades uh, new vendors from um, thinking that new nuclear is a good idea. Against that, of course, you've got energy stability. So new nuclear power um, could provide huge amounts of energy for a very long time. The strike price for Hinkley C is set for 35 years. So for 35 years, EDF will get £92.50, or the equivalent of the inflation at that point in time. Um, and after that 35 years, the plant can be expected to operate for another 25 years, maybe another 35 years, um, which won't be pure profit because there's operating costs to cover, but by that point in time, the build financing should have been covered. So the economics changed significantly after that point in time. But in 60 years' time, who knows what the energy pitch will look like? Who, know, who knows what sort of energy sources we'll need? So it's a long risk over a long time. What do we need to do to change that? Well, we can do two things. We can either change the risk or we can change the reward. In terms of changing the risk, increase government support, use of proven technologies, so use of the types of uh, reactors we've seen already, um, and decrease project scale. So decreasing the size of the reactors we're installing, decreases the build time scales, and decreases the costs associated with them. Finally, in terms of the reward, there's something called a regulated asset base model, um, which has been used in the London super sewer successfully, uh, and that aims to start paying the operator for the service they're going to provide before they've actually started providing it. 
There's carbon trading to um, decrease the cost of uh, carbon neutral uh, energy generation. There's also guaranteeing multiple sites or plants to vendors. And finally, there's the contracts for difference that we've seen, um, which does make a difference, but isn't always, if employ employed just on its own, enough to be successful. So, to conclude, nuclear has been a stable part of the UK energy mix for about 60 years and generally is accepted by the government um, to be needed for the foreseeable future to meet our uh, carbon reduction targets. Current new build rates do not meet projected future needs and three of the six projects that are planned are currently on hold. The two that are yet to be agreed uh, also have potential troubles associated with them. Um, and finally, in order to make our installed nuclear capacity meet the requirements of our energy usage, we do need to look at changing in policy. So how are we going to help manufacturers balance the risk reward profile? Well, supporting smaller projects, associated technology development, um, supporting the build phases to a greater degree, and finally taking a greater share of the risk. Thank you very much. So now we've got uh, Thomas. Thomas, both Geoffrey and Stephen stuck exactly to their time, so no pressure. No pressure, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> be all right. I have my phone here, so just tell okay, me. Ten minutes. Yeah, cool. Okay. So thank you, Jack, for the introduction. Um, I'll quickly uh, say, so I'm Thomas Davis. I am uh, the Director of Nuclear Engineering, Engineering Consultant at uh, Davis & Musgrove Limited, but also a PhD candidate at Oxford and also an office cadet at the Oxford University Royal Naval Unit, Royal Naval Reserves. So I have a background in industry, academia, and military. So obviously the next point of call is my disclosure. Um, everything I say beyond this is my personal opinion alone, and I do not represent any of the institutions with this presentation. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is, could the global transition to generation four nuclear reactors strengthen Russia's growing sphere of influence? Uh, so I've got 10 minutes, we'll give that a go. <laughs> So first thing is, what would Russia say is Vladimir Putin in 2005 declared that Russia would become a world leader in energy supply. Here, energy supply also defines nuclear energy supply. Um, but what does that really mean? If we look at China's statement, which this is all about a Russia presentation, but China kind of really said it in a very explicit terms. So China's uh, nuclear energy director of the China Atomic Energy Authority stated in 2016 that nuclear energy is an important cornerstone of strategic power and a vehicle for civilian and military integration and a China card to play in the country's international cooperation diplomacy. So at the end of this uh, presentation, hopefully you have an idea what, what I mean by that. So current export market in 2018, the economists actually got a nice little graph or a little map of where all the current reactors are constructing today. Um, Russia are building 39 nuclear reactors outside its country. Um, to give you a comparison, the United States is two. Those two are in Sanmen in China, and they're funded by China, um, and they're nearly, nearly complete. And beyond that, the United States are not exporting at all, and France are tied up in the European Union. South Korea are exporting uh, their reactor design in uh, UAE, um, but they've also uh, announced that they will not be constructing any more nuclear power in South Korea. So what does that say about export uh, technology? But also, um, since 2018, Russia have also made agreements of some memorandum of understanding of some sort to do with nuclear technology or the exploration of nuclear technology in these countries. And uh, so you've got countries like uh, Cuba, Ghana, um, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, uh, and Zambia, for example. Um, I just want to just, the point of this is to highlight is just the sheer number of countries. That's all. Um, and who, who is... Who is, this, who is the company behind this? So Rosatom is the uh, Russian Federation state-owned nuclear utility company. They offer a, a, a compelling package of a nuclear reactor. So if you want to buy one, they will offer you um, a VVVR, which is a pre standard pressure water reactor, 1,200 megawatts of electrical energy. But they will provide you training, designing, construction, decommissioning, uh, commissioning, operating, decommissioning, they will solve your nuclear waste solutions, either take your waste out of your country, and they'll also fully fi financial package as well, um, which sounds like a really good idea. Also, I would say that creates dependency um, on, on Russia and Rosatom providing these reactors. And they're also like 60-year project timeline. Um, and in 2018, the export market um, is currently, Rosatom has 67% of the export market in reactor construction today. And they have about $113 billion on order uh, of reactors, to give you a number. And um, so that's, uh, uh, that's all about the current field right now, which is 
thing called Generation 3 nuclear reactors. So I'll, kind of, I'll go through the definitions of one to four in a very quick way. One is reactors which have been constructed and now are gone. So you can ignore them. Generation two are reactors which are currently operating today, producing electricity. Um, so these are the ADRs and stuff like that, and pressure water reactors. Generation three and generation three plus generally means uh, reactors which are in construction today. Um, we can their definitions do do change slightly. Generation four is actually the reactors which are post that. Um, so that's the research field I kind of work in. Um, and we're talking about 2030, 2040 time of operation, and they will last for 60 to 100 years lifetime, depending on reactor type. Um, so with Gen 4, who, who's currently leading Gen 4? What is all, you know, the current space of Generation 4? Um, so you look at uh, United States, UK, and the EU. We currently don't have any Gen 4-like test reactors. Gen 4-like test reactors, anything sodium cooled based lead cooled based molten salt-based, high-temperature gas reactors, um, and there's a supercritical water reactor um, as well. They don't exist. Uh, so, and Russia do lead the R&D space. Um, I read a lot of Russian, um, there's a lot of Russian uh, research coming out um, from its Bohr 60 reactor, which is a sodium cooled fast reactor, it's a test reactor. Uh, it's been operating since 1969. Um, a lot of the world's academics in my field use this reactor. I also use it in my research because we haven't got a choice, it's the only one. Um, and Russia also are building their MBIR reactor, which is called the Multipurpose Research Reactor, which actually can test all of those different technologies I mentioned uh, in, in one type of reactor. And that's actually in construction now, the, the pressure vessel's going in uh, in a couple of years' time. In addition to that, Russia also have this series of reactors called BN, uh, which is essentially a sodium cooled fast reactor, which is essentially a generation four. It's the closest thing we've got to a generation four reactor. They actually built them in, um, in the 80s called BN350 series, um, and they've had another reactor called 600, 800. They all reference the power output. Um, two are still operating today, and they've also sold BN800, which is what the picture is. Uh, what you're seeing there, the orange dome is on top of the reactor core. It's not the reactor core itself, that's actually way below that picture, but they decided to paint it orange. Um, and they've sold that to China, so China are building two of these reactors today. Um, that's the closest we've got to Generation 4. Um, and to give you an idea, no one else is, 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 looking, is constructing these things. So where does the sphere of influence come from, from Rosatom? Um, if you look at today, uh, so they will provide, they have a state-backed um, nuclear package, uh, which has a pretty much proven reactor design. It's pretty um, well established, which is the VVVR, which is the generation three, three plus, depending on what definition you want to use. They will also provide a full financial package. Um, uh, well, obviously, of interest, you have to pay back as a country, generally 40 to 60 year lifetime. Um, they'll, again, nuclear waste solutions, um, so they take your waste away. Uh, it doesn't come back, um, or it could come back. Uh, so they're basically dominating the, the nuclear market today. And that all creates dependency if you want to build one of these reactors in your country. But if you look at tomorrow being a, a fictitious you know, 20, 30 years down the line, uh, the Generation 4 sector is also state-backed by, by Russia. They've announced many statements um, uh, from uh, Putin about state, having state-backed Gen 4 reactors. BN series experience, they, they're, they're the only ones which actually have a Generation 4-like reactor with experience, and they've also exported it to China. Um, they're leading in the space, then these lifetimes are 60 to 100 years, so we're talking 2100 uh, when they start coming offline. Um, currently no competitors, um, and I would argue this uh, solidifies their sphere of influence, which I'll go on to talk about in a sec what that actually means. But how can we compete in this space in the UK and US? When I say we, I mean UK, US in this case. So UK history. Um, You've got doom ray test reactor and prototype fast reactor, which were a sodium potassium reactor and a sodium reactor in the... Um, 60s to 90s. And actually, um, talking about uh, what Jeffrey mentioned, um, we actually have experiences diminishing here. Um, we, we don't know anything really much about how these reactors operated anymore, because either the information is lost um, or not categorized, and the people who have worked on them are either retired or, or passed on, um, which is a significant problem. Same with the United States. The United States had um, test reactors, um, and they all closed down in the 90s, um, and also the experience is diminishing. Um, so how do we get it back? How do we start um, thinking about long-term future strategy? Um, number one, you've got to decide on the technology. This is a three-step plan, so quite easy, right? You decide on which Generation 4 React technology you want to go. You've got to build it. You've got to build a test reactor to actually test your theories. Um, which, and then you've got to have, this is where the controversy is, a state-backed commercial export. And if you actually look how Russia do it, Russia have already decided on technologies. They're already building test reactors, and they've already got state-backed commercial export. Um, so if we want to compete against this in the long-term frame, 
uh, your window of opportunity um, to compete against Russia in a general market is actually quite closing um, if you don't make any decisions today. So it's now, within the next five years, you're going to make a key decision on your Gen 4 program. Which leads me to um, my last point, and I'll, I'll close after this, um, is, you know, Vladimir Putin did say in 2005 they'll become a world leader in, in, in nuclear energy export, and, and they've done that. Uh, they've done that with the Generation 3 reactors. But you ask, why would they do that? What's the motive um, behind all this? Is it because they have this, you know, wonderful technology, um, another controversial uh, uh, statement, um, is it for the good cause of providing electricity to other countries? Is it because they can tackle climate change because it's a reduction of CO2? Um, which is what they tell you in press statements. Exactly what they tell you. And a lot of people do believe that's true. But uh, if you actually go to the original source of something, so you actually go to look at uh, the energy security doctrine, uh, which has been released by uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, and I've got a prop. So here it, here it is. It was released in, in May last month. Um, and if you go to page... Five, if you're interested, and section 13, part B, which is in Russian. I don't actually speak Russian. Um, I've got a very good friend called Anna Davison who translated for me. She's a defense uh, um, consultant for NATO and a, and a affiliate to a Russian and Eastern European uh, research group at St. Anthony's College in Oxford. And what it actually states is um, pretty clear. Um, it will go, section 13 states, military political threats to energy security. It goes on to say, um, I quote, threatens the anything which threatens the extraction, transportation, or consumption of Russian energy, as well as limiting the possibility, possibility use of Russian technology and previous and provisions of Russian organizations, um, energy services. So basically anything which threats um, the construction use of Russian technology in other countries is a military threat. Um, it kind of makes sense uh, that it is a threat if these reactors create a dependency on another country uh, to Russia. Um, so what can we do about it? Um, I have a three-step program, so if you start doing that, you may be able to compete against this and can tell their, uh, their influence. That was it. I'll close. Thank you.